Hello everyone, how are we all doing? Um, check that screen. Yeah. Not sure if that's a bit... I think that might be a bit loud. I'll turn it down a bit. Eee, that should be okay. Hopefully that's okay. I don't know. Sometimes it just goes funny. It's been on MS Teams and that always makes it go a bit weird. So, first things first. Make sure these are all plugged in nice and tight. Hey, bike on. Sorry. And reorganize that a bit. Because the last thing I want is that resting on that. Good afternoon, everyone. Let's see. We've got Karl Magasberg. Hello. We have Blue Shirt Buddha. We have Albert Zaski. We have Martin Dock. We have Ian Carr. We have King's Rook. Hello. Jack Hunter. Hello, William Cox. Hello, thank you, Toon Jack, for giving reminders. Um, hello, Brock Payne. Hello, Depp Squirt. Old Richard. William Cox. Hello. Right now, hello, Dano Kindhammer. Hello. Jack Hunter, not bad. Started reading some of my books. ABC's autobiography is ridiculously fascinating. That it is. That is. Hello, DGV40. Hello, Aviator Enterprise. Uh Hello, Jeff Beeler. I always thought the Suez in 1936 was a hot war. Well, it is a hot war, but I decided the definition of it going hot is the superpowers actually getting militarily involved. Uh, William Cox, the Suez was deception, dissemination, and outright lying by major nations struggling to maintain empire. Uh, we're going to shoot that one down quite quickly. End of European colonialism from Felix B. No, no. Suez gets a lot of write-up post-it. We'll leave that to one side. There's a lot of, uh, you know, fun that comes afterwards. The people write about the Suez, but it's not there. Hello, Daniel Freeman. Um... Hello, Paul Beswick. Hello, Martin Doc. Oh, Martin Doc, you are NASA seized the canal after UK and US refused to support his loan request with the IMF as he had brought military hardware from the Eastern Bloc. To an extent, yes, he was playing both sides off against the other. Brock Payne, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. Angus Sonnel, hello. Hello, everyone. Right then. Costas Patas, hello! How are you doing? Ian Carr, hello. Jermac, hello. And Strub, reeling forward this. It's an um, off. <laughs> Little wins. Right. Jeff Hill, I thought Britain and France were superpowers. Britain and France were world powers. In fact, Britain was still pretty much the preeminent world power. And we're going to start off with some background. Because all of you who think this is straightforward, well, I'm sorry. And there is a reason I haven't put out an introduction video today. I've decided that this is definitely a long patrol material because there is nothing short or to the point about any of this. Have you, uh, King's Rook, have you seen the Time Ghost History videos on the Suez City Crisis? And if so, what do you think of it? I thought they were good, but I think there's a problem with... Quite a lot of the history wants to play into the narrative which comes up after it, not looking at the narrative before it. Um... So, themes of the 1950s Middle East. You have the Cold War. NASA especially enjoyed playing USA off against USSR. He wanted a lot of USS, uh, USA weapons, and he wouldn't say what he wanted them for. So for some reason, with the ongoing issues between 
um, the Arab world and Israel, America wasn't keen on supplying them. But America did want Egypt to be the cornerstone of their Middle East defense organization, which basically died when Eisenhower left office because it was terrible, an absolutely terrible idea. It just, just wouldn't work. Um, mainly because he was trying to link everyone together and most people didn't agree that the idea of linking it together. The anti-colonial struggle of Arab nationalists against the two remaining imperial powers, Britain and France. This is, of course, seen by the Egyptian Revolution of 1952, the Anglo-Egyptian Agreement of 1954, the Algerian War of 1954-62, and the Baghdad Pact of 1955, which is what really upsets Nasser, because he thinks this is giving the Hashemite kingdoms far too much power and prominence, thanks to Britain. Um, unfortunately, his plan that this war, uh, his plan that seizing the canal would show he was strong and force them to break off from it, it didn't really work either. Uh, and it actually managed to survive longer than the uh, longer than the Algerian War does, because again, Britain manages to pull off the usual trick of we're not France, we're not as nasty as the Russians we're actually not going to really interfere with you internally, and frankly, we're not bothered about that. We will build you a very nice railway, um, which worked quite well for a bit. First, uh, so it lasted until 1979, and then there's the Arab-Israeli dispute, which is amazing, because all the Americans, especially Dulles, are going around in the Middle East going, you have to worry about communism, 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 communism! And everyone else is going, Zionism, Zionism, at them, and they're just not quite sure. And then there's the Arab Cold War on top of it, where actually most of the Arab nations don't like each other. Uh, I know these days we talk about Sunni Shiite and, uh, Shiite and all this one, but actually in... It, no, it's still, it's still. The Arab nations just don't really like each other that much. They just want to compete the whole time. Jeff Hina, how could the Anglo-French operations have gone better? Mm, they couldn't really. They went about as well as they could do. All right. Uh, Ian Carr, NASA was playing to his domestic Egyptian audience and was extremely popular as a result. Uh, he was popular post-revision of what happened in the crisis. Okay? I've had this debate and discussion with people, and lots of people of a certain generation do actually believe that NASA's troops managed to force at, well, did until, well, until there was sort of internet and various other things managed to destroy that, um, did actually believe that NASA's troops had managed to kick the British and the French out of Egypt. As we all know, that didn't actually happen. We'll leave that to one side. Jeff Hiller, was there a realistic plan to flood the Quattro Depression? The canal would, would make the Libyan border stronger. Um, not really. Ian Happy, hello. Dan Freeman, Suez Christ is simple. It's the Middle East. How can it be simple? How far back you... <laughs> Uh, yes. Uh, ba uh, basically, the whole point is, the reason it's going for a long patrol is every introduction video I recorded, and I have made six attempts at introduction videos, just didn't come out right. Jeff Miller, what was the route of the Centro Railway Road? It went through Turkey and was heading to Iran. Right then. Jeff Biller, how much the 1956 mirror 1882? Not a lot at all. 
Uh, Inca, on reflection today in the Middle East, would the USA have preferred a Suzerland Canal buffer zone between Egypt and Israel? Well, considering the current relationship, probably it's, they know they'd be quite happy with the, the, that not being the case. But here is the first thing we're going to put down. And we'll get more into this later. But Britain cannot have multiple diplomatic conferences which involve America to discuss this issue. Cannot make multiple statements in the House of Commons, in France making them in public of the leaders, stating pretty much what they're going to do. Cannot organise a fleet of 112 odd ships alone, from the Britain alone, there's another 30 or so from France, in the space of six weeks, without the Americans seeing it. I am sorry, but the Americans have huge fricking bases and all sorts of personnel in Allied combined operations. There are New Zealanders, Canadians and all sorts of things spread around the very much Commonwealth British forces at this point. So, anyone who believes the Americans did not know what the British and French were planning and also over the details of the operations to their contacts in American intelligence etc going this is what we're going to do I'm sorry you've been duped by the uh, not probably by the Americans but it was a very useful spin for Egypt to put on afterwards and to an extent for the Soviet Union to put on afterwards because it suggest there was far more dissension in the ranks in NATO than there actually was. The thing was, for the Americans, they got involved because basically the British and French were half expecting to invade and for there to be a counter-revolution which would take out NASA because he wasn't that popular at that time within Egypt and there were still large elements of the Egyptian officer corps especially, which were not that pro-revolution, or rather not that pro nasas faction running the revolution, who, would, uh, who they did expect to use the opportunity of the crisis of the invasion to launch a coup and take out NASA, and then provide someone who would agree to the treaty continuing as it had been planned till 1968. Remember this. The treaty was due to expire in 1968. E e Egypt was due to get back control of the canal. No muss, no fuss, nothing in 1968. Which I know is 12 more years and you can sit there and go, yeah, da 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 But actually, in the Allied terms, this was why the extent Suez was such a shock. Because everyone was going, they get it back in 12 years without causing any issues. They're taking unilaterally control. They're banning the Israelis from going through what is in international waters. They are actually not paying the canal company what it's worth. Uh... And, to be honest, NASA seems to have caught half his own leadership on the hop. Half his own government didn't know what he was planning on doing. So it's, a, it's an interesting time. Prime Mark 359, uh, is this a what if about what if US and Anglo French forces started shooting at each other? Honestly, no, because the more and more I looked into it, and I thought I could do that, but I would have had to get probably someone else involved to have a long chat about that. It's very unlikely the US and Anglo and French forces are going to shoot each other. It's incredibly unlikely. But there is a what if which does come through this. And there is a very much a possible what if, because it's unlikely the Americans are going to start a fight with the British or the French, because they really can't claim not to have been told what was going to happen. Although I know many write-ups say they're surprised, they're shocked, so yes, 
The Prime, British Prime Minister has made two statements in the House of Commons on this subject. The French President has talked about this. There have been numerous contacts for our third resources, and in six weeks they gathered a force of nearly 150 ships. Yes, we're shocked. We're horrified. Five aircraft carriers. We're so shocked. Jeff Eler, when the British realised that they had to treat the rest of the world that they want uh, the way they treated South America and go commercial and run things from the city? Ooh, about 1956. Well, no, they always had that plan. That's always the preferred interest uh, British plan. Uh, Ian Carr, how much of the UK for air effort was FAA and how much was it based from Cyprus? Where did the French air effort come from? The French air effort came from Algeria and, to an extent, came from Syria. But also quite a lot came from Cyprus. The British air effort mostly came from aircraft carriers and Cyprus. There was a good mixture of it. But there is quite a heavy, hefty FAA unit in it. Derp Squad. Would the Americans have looked the other way if the invasion had worked better than they did? If NASA had been toppled, the Americans would have gone in behind the British and the French and established the International Community Committee to oversee the running of the canal. I can guarantee that. But with NASA staying in charge, it looking like it's going to turn into a quagmire. Eisenhower not keen on getting involved in a quagmire. He, does, he pushes the other way. Cox. Oh, I do not forgive colonialism in anyone. I have this crazy notion nations should act with reason and out of a desire to establish and maintain good relations with all neighbours and trading partners. That's a lovely idea. Pramark 359. A dozen years when you need a lot of revenue to develop your economy? Well, that is the fact you can say. But... The British and the other allies felt they were working with Egypt. You see, to them, they were helping Egypt. They were working Egypt. They were asking for some concessions, but they were also providing large amounts of money. And again, you have to realize that up until 1956, the largest investors in Egypt are not the Americans, are not the Soviets. They are the British and the French. So a lot of the loans which the Egyptian government is operating on are from the British and the French. JP, NASA needed money in 1956, not 12 years later. I guess, ironically, by 1968, in reality, Suez Canal become useless and eventually somewhat redundant due to ship growth. That is part of the issue. But please note, when the operations take place, and this is part of what I'm doing, they are pretty much a rerun almost of D-Day in terms of their amphibious assault capability. You've got these huge landing ship tanks, mostly leftovers from World War II. Some of them were built, still building at the end of it and were built and had finished afterwards. And you have a Centurion tank landing. And... If we do want to get into the operations, just quickly, I will, um, let's put it this way. Here are the stats from the operation. The Israelis deployed 175,000 personnel, the British 45,000, the French 34,000. The Egyptian strength was roughly 300,000. The losses on the Isra for the Israelis were 172 killed, 817 wounded, and one captured. For the United Kingdom, 16 killed, 96 wounded. For the French, 10 killed and 33 wounded. For the Egyptians, between 1,650 and to 3,000 killed. At least 1,000 civilians killed. 4,900 wounded. Between five and 30,000, possibly more, captured. 
Plus, they lost 125 tanks and over 215 aircraft. If you'd been telling someone in World War II that they would run an operation and they would achieve those figures, they would have been absolutely ecstatic. Derp Squad, so the US had the best of both worlds by knowing and saying they didn't. If it works, they have the world's well, yeah, they have both the world's major canals. If it fails, they have they are the peacemakers and keepers. Bingo. Hello, Road and Cash. Yes, Danny Freeman, the Centurion tank. Hello, gorgeous. Yes. Dan Freeman, was the USA still distracted by Korea in nineteen fifty six? USA was distracted by basically the Soviet Union everywhere in 1956. This is half the trouble with the Middle East because, again, it's really interesting. They try, they fail, and the British do actually set up a NATO equivalent. And then it's the American mucking around, arguably, in Iran and turning it into a Cold War battleground that leads to revolution, which leads to the breaking up of the thing which they'd really wanted to achieve but actually hadn't managed to join. Angst what started this whole affair? Who was the first belligerent? You could talk about the French invasion of Egypt back under Napoleon. It's a long-running issue of foreigners inside controlling Egyptian soil. And it's a major national asset. But for... Egypt, there are issues with what they want to do. Seizing control of the canal turns out to be a bit of a poison chalice, especially when they don't the the Egypt the Israelis don't really get pushed back, and frankly, they have lost they've lost control of the canal completely. So instead of you can say that they, they he achieves a political victory. The Suez Canal has definitely turns into a political victory for NASA and longer uh, we cause him. But short to medium term, it's not the economic victory and it's not the thing he needed. But really, NASA starts behaving in a way which... Again, you have to consider the mindset of the people dealing with him. Okay? The mindset of quite a lot of the people in Britain, the people in France... They have experience of charismatic leaders who've come to power in interesting ways, who have desires on revisionism, on perhaps expansion, on achieving a leadership position in their area. The British and the French see NASA and they're thinking Mussolini, Hitler, that's what they're thinking. More Mussolini, actually. They don't think they're dealing with someone of that of particular sort of desk, but Mussolini is definitely a factor in their sort of thinking. In happy, I rather think Nessa needed a military win quickly to establish his wavering support with the Egyptian military, promote his profile as the leader of part of the Arabian world. Arab, Arabian world. Yep. Melanie 16040. Any duplex drive Shermans? None of the duplex drive Shermans seem to turn up. Uh, not on the British side or the French. The, the British are mainly getting centurions ashore. They don't really have many Shermans around anymore. The Egyptians have a hodgepodge military. There's a picture I've got later of a Jagdpanfer, which gets blown up. Randa boy, would you still have needed a... $500 incandescent light bulb to transmit under this international group to run the canal? Um, probably. Probably. Death Squad. Uh, NASA nationalised the canal from a British-French company. Britain and France were the first to make it military. Not really, because NASA nationalised it by sending in the Egyptian army to seize the officers. So the Egyptian are it's a civilian run organization at this point, the canal, it's all civilians, and suddenly then the Egyptian military turns up and forcefully ejects 
without harming anyone, but falsely ejects the British and the French administrators who are there and takes over the running of the company. And they do actually beat up some of the Egyptian people who work for them. Derp Squad, I don't think so. The British, French and British were using tanks designed after World War II by this point. Not really for this operation. You've got the Centurion from the British and I think the French one as well. It, they're, they're pretty much World War II tanks as far as... They are late World War II tanks, but they are World War II tanks. Derp Squad. The, oh yes, the answer to why doesn't Iran have a democratic question. A uh, government. Question. The CIA and MS6. Actually, no, you can't really blame the MI6 much on it. They were mostly telling the CIA and the KGB to stop mucking around. Um, and the CIA kept having ideas about how they could improve things. That's the trouble. When you Because the CIA and the KGB view Iran through the Cold War lens of communism versus capitalism. Of democracy versus dictatorship. And they don't um, look into the actual local sphere. This is part of what happens in sewers. Arabite, Melanie, you have to carry a special light on the bow of a special bulb made under a permit of the Egyptian government, the Transit Canal. They last only five, about 500 hours if you're lucky. Yep. Daniel Freeman. Britain was trying to keep a degree of peace in Palestine, both pre- and post-World War, getting attacked by Palestinian Jewish Zionists, both pre- and post-World War, yeah. In car, Suez Canal, Suez Canal has never been widened, which probably is a consequence of the continuing instability in the area. And also because the Egyptian actions in 1968 kind of meant that the, the point at which there would have been money around the world and interest in expanding them went away. It wasn't available that time. The Panama Canal has been expanded. The Suez Canal has just been outgrown. And as we speak, the next generation of ships are getting bigger and bigger. And it's probably going to be the case. So, what else do we have going on in the world's point? We have a North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Now, here's the interesting thing. This is the big... You always see this today. It's associated with President Trump all the time. But this is President Truman signing the treaty in 1949 and it's all considered a great piece of American diplomacy actually right so there is a treaty of Dunkirk in 1947 which the British and French sign basically to say that if the Soviet Union decides to push this way out of Germany we will be there to look after you and we will defend you. And slowly, other powers start to join it. Belgium, all these things. Eventually, the Commonwealth nations, i.e. Canada, decides to join. Because they really don't want to get involved in another European war. And they consider deterrence the best option. Plus, they're looking at the growth in the Soviet bomber force and thinking we'd rather like some protection. And then the Americans join in and becomes the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. It's all great. But it doesn't really become the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. It becomes the North Atlantic Treaty. It doesn't start to become an organization till after the Korean War. So when people start to say, oh, we can date the, the, the NATO to 1949. Well, actually, you can probably date it to 1947 if you're basing it off treaty. But actually, if you're basing off when it actually becomes an organization we can understand as NATO today, you're probably talking about 1951 and possibly even 1952. And there is that thing 
just before all this is going on with Warsaw, with the Suez Canal crisis, the year before, West Germany joins NATO, and immediately the Soviet Union goes. Oh, we might, uh, we uh, were so horrified this. We must form the Warsaw Pact. Now, here's the thing, and this is a point I often make. If the Warsaw Pact hadn't already pretty much existed, there is no way on earth you could have manufactured it, even with the scenario behind the Iron Curtain, in eight days. It just isn't going to happen. You need to put all sorts of infrastructure in place, and it's ready to go in eight days. Why? Because that infrastructure already existed as part of the Comitern's management. The Warsaw Pact is just putting a fancy name on it. Basically, it's about the war for world opinion. The Soviets didn't want to announce it earlier because then they might have looked scared of NATO. And they didn't want to look scared, but they also didn't want to suddenly announce it and destabilize things. Whereas if they're doing it off the back of the German announcement, then they're not doing destabilizing. They're responding with firmness because of Germany, because it's German aggression. It's all German aggression which started World War II. There was absolutely no joint pact with the Soviet Union to split up Poland. There was absolutely nothing to do with other factors going on in the world. It was all purely German aggression. Back in here, hello. Hello? In Carl, was there a DD Centurion? No. It would have been fun to be one, but there wasn't one. In Happy, Enlarging the Canal is one of those Egyptian projects which has been on the agenda for decades now, but never implemented due to lack of funds and skills. Mmm, yeah. That and their economy has shifted heavily in favour of tourism. Dear God, the CIA overthrew the democratic government of Iran because, ten years after the end of World War II, they had the audacity to ask if they could stop giving the war discount for oil. Ronan Cash. Hello. They they also had minor left-wing political members, and that was more than enough. Yes, pretty much there's always mine. The interesting thing about NASA is there is quite so much about him which goes both ways. He is, he is great fun politically. But, again, if we're getting into NATO, we're getting into the Middle East at this point, you have to remember the American perspective is incredibly dominated by a Cold War which is being viewed through first the Truman Doctrine and then the Eisenhower Doctrine, which are zero-sum games. They are very much zero-sum games. We either win or we lose. There is no grey area. You're either with us or against us. There is no grey area. You either do what we need you to do as allies, or you don't. There is no grey area. This is another reason why I point out with all these structures in place, with all the British and the French inclusion in NATO at this point, it's another reason why when you go, you know what, the Americans didn't notice them putting together a task force of 150 ships, dozens upon dozens of squadrons, all this stuff. No, 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 it was kept secret from the Americans. Yes, it's pre-satellites, but the Americans have freaking bases. They have personnel literally working at joint headquarters in Portsmouth and Plymouth and Gibraltar. Are you telling me they're not going to look out the window at some point? Um, Ian Carr, Britain bears a lot of responsibility for the shape of the Middle East following the Balfour Declaration of 1970. Yep, that we do. JPL, interesting aspect of Operation, Operation Hamlecar name dropped when it was found that British market and British was painting H in the vehicles while the French were painting mate. Yeah, that was one fun thing. 
and so it became Musketeer. And then it became Musketeer Revise, but we'll get into that in a second. Actually, Martin Doc, the original plan was to land in Alexandria, push in towards Cairo, have a massive tank battle just south of Cairo on an area which had been used as a practice area during World War II for tanks, wipe out the Egyptian army, then go to Cairo. Eventually, after realising this might be a little on the, on the intensive war war side, they went back to the first plan, which was Port Said. And if you take that and you take the rest, it works. William Cox, my video on the origins blame for World War II says everyone was responsible. Pretty much everyone has a portion to go around. There are some powers which their actions do lead about more, more, but yeah, they all have some things involved. You can argue that the British and French, if they'd responded more strongly, quickly to the German aggression at an earlier stage, they would have tamped down on it. Hmm. Carmen, hello. There is a slight static in the background. I am not sure why. How about if I turn that down? Does that create the take the static out? Hmm. Ian Carr, when were Sentco and Seto sent up? Um, Sentco, if we go back quickly, as I've pointed out, Sentco, uh, Sento Central Treaty Organization, um, uh, evolved from, for, uh, well, it goes Baghdad Pact of 1955, that evolves into the Middle Eastern Treaty Organization, or METO, and eventually into the Central Treaty Organization, or CENTO. Uh, CETO's late, uh, a little later as well. Basically, the idea is you put everything together. Now, this is some of the pictures of the ground fight. And yes, that is a Jag Panther. And yes, it has been destroyed. Because the British and the French basically go on a we have complete air dominance. We are going to hit everything. There might be a reason why the Egyptian army and armed forces to this day are obsessed with air defence. It might well be a legacy of 1956, but if you ever look at their forces, they have a curiously large number, both in range and of volume, of air defence equipment for their relative armed forces size. Melanie, 16040. You're forgetting all the American working uh, Americans working there worked and lived in buildings without windows. Also, travelled with blinders on, so they couldn't see anything assemble. Possibly that that could have been true. They managed to drive around all with everything covered up. Still there. Hmm. I have no idea why. Uh, let me just check the settings. Mm-hmm. <laughs>
hopefully that should have worked it done. The, but I'm not sure. We'll see. If it doesn't fix it, tell me and I will carry on trying to work it out. Why is that this bit? No, I don't want you to go there. I want you to stay there. Good. Right. It's a variation. It's uh, ISU, but it's a variation on Jag Panfire as well. It's, um, oh, what is it? I've got it all here. It's ISU. Yours. Yeah, that is a, uh, actually that is a Su one hundred, I think. Um, yeah. I think it's a Su one hundred. Based on T thirty four, yeah. Su one hundred, sorry. I had another picture which was a Jag Panther which they had, but I put that away and used the Su one hundred. Sorry. Brain slowly dying. Car Harman, I believe it made it worse. Hmm, that's annoying. We'll see. Uh, let's see. EON 6177. My father was transferred to HMS Eagle for this Lord Jolly in the Med. A lot of people were transferred around. This is another reason why I go. This was no hiding it. Hmm. Mm. Uh, Paul Beswick, if the French had had a strategic reserve in 1940, everything would have probably gone differently. They had a strategic reserve, they just didn't have the infrastructure to move it. It look, uh, Jemek, it looks more like a Soviet ASU tank looking down the wheels. Yes, it's a 100. Sorry, I was asking. Sorry, everyone. Yeah, as I said, I was... It's on me. I had the picture of a Jag Panther in there earlier. And I took, I changed it round, and then worrying about the sound, yeah. I think that goes to Melanie sixteen oh forty for watching and spotting that first, but I'm not sure. Let's see. Oh, fixed. His stopped. Well, hey, John Shane. Hello, Doctor. Sorry, I'm late. Missed over just a half an hour. Well, oh, don't worry. We're half, we're already beginning. Um. Staff Thompson, hello. Don't worry. Ronan Cash, I think Macmillan met with Duels or Eisenhower on a golf course to get the nod, and either did or stitched that British PM. Sorry, been saying 20 years since I did CIA studies. Yes, Macmillan did meet with Duels, but I don't honestly wonder sometimes if Duels was passing on anything to Eisenhower at all. Um, Duels seems to be completely preoccupied with the. Cold War front and is not really looking. Come, on, your mission tonight, should you choose to accept it, or is to not be going mad writing eBay descriptions for games. Hmm, that sounds fun. Jeff Peter, France had foreign legion and separate colonial parachute regiments in the 1950s, mostly disbanded after the, Arge after the Algiers coup. As I see, don't confuse Jag Panther with Jag Panzer. Jag Panther is the name of a specific type. Jag Panzer, a family of tanks. Yeah. I, it's probably not confusing. It's probably my pronunciation, which is confusing. So I will try and avoid it. Actually, I prefer dealing with Soviet vehicles because Soviet vehicles, it's Su-100 or yeah, or the ISL-3, which is, of course, the Josef Stalin-3, which, if you want to see the turrets of, they still are in our fortified posts along the Russian-Chinese border to this day and are maintained. If you want to go see the most perfectly preserved turrets of Josef Stalin free tanks. Hello, Admiral. Well, Jeff Bieler, what effect does Suez have on the Royal Navy later? It has a huge impact on the Royal Navy. For starters, I would argue that quite a lot of the East of Suez decisions are based on the cost of actually going through the Suez Canal post-Suez crisis. 
and the issues with going through there. You have to go around the world. You've got requires far more infrastructure to support. Ah, no, 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 read current comments, it's fixed. Well, the trouble is, sometimes my live chat doesn't update for a few minutes, and then I get a full whoosh. I'm still working that one out. Um, it's This is the wrong t-shirt to be wearing for today. I wore it ironically because I was teaching my students about time management. So I thought it would be a good t-shirt for wearing for them. Those Frank won't done. The Inhabi, did the French field anything heavier than the AMX 13 there? No. The British brought all the heavy equipment. The British brought the, the huge proportion of the force. Inhabi, yes, found it. The Egyptian Su 100 would actually check SD 100s. <laughs> so they say it changed the name. Kahlman, if you want to go to see old Swedish tanks, just go to Swedish shore defences. Yes, they do use them, Kyle. No. I guess they're in place of fortifications and still maintained. What on earth? Yes, there are, I think, last count. And I was talking about a friend with this, a friend about this the other day. There are some region, region of 120 to 140 still actively maintained. Of the original 260 odd to cover two lines of the fixed defense over the Russian uh, Russian Chinese border. That's how much they trust each other. There is a whole in place defense, and it actually received funding and was maintained um, still to this day. Race, uh, race car meerkat. Not quite sure whether the trip is worth uh, to Russian Chinese worth it, but uh, very cool. It'd be a very cold trip, but yeah. Seven thousand. What pristine? <laughs> yes, they have shells. They are fully loaded. It's a uh, quite an interesting scenario. Carmen, France just came to show unity. No, France's important contribution was aircraft, air bases, and what they could supply in terms of personnel and ground troops. The British were supplying the naval forces which got them there. Force A1, there was a prototype DD Centurion which didn't ever enter service. Now, let's expand this and have a quick look at the, some of the crisis factors. So, it did not come out of nowhere. In fact, there had even before the uh, NASA's seizure of the canal, there had been some discussions and dialogues going on. The British and French, in through multiple dialogues, had thought the Americans understood that if the international option for running the canal was turned down... That for Britain, it was a strategic impossibility for the defence of the East. And this is also part of the trouble in the Cold War scenario. Because of NASA's ambiguity in terms of whether he's pro-American, pro-Soviet and all these things, they don't really trust him in the Cold War context to control the Suez Canal, where British and French forces might have to be funneled through, or American forces funneled through, to get out to the Far East quickly. So this is half the trouble. His ambiguity, which is so good for giving him strategic independence, also means that people don't trust him. Actually, also, there is the fact that the CIA at one point brag that he's um, an asset for them and is an actual of someone they control. They get disabused at this point, but they just realize because he, they just think because he goes out to dinner a few times with a CIA agent and is, uh, you know, quite happy to play golf with them, that he's um, one of their assets. But it still meant they were caught off guard on 26th of July 1956. Now, a 
as I put there, I'm going to emphasize again. The idea that the US didn't know what was going on is basically some very nice spin. For someone, I'm not sure who. <laughs> so it's very developed, very developed. Yeah, that much was clear. The Su-100 was still quite familiar looking. Don't know a lot about post-World War II Soviet tanks. There are a few, no, they're quite good. Jeff Hewlett, was HMS Eagle scrapped early because it reminded the UK of their failure in Suez? No. That was money saving. The British, in the nicest way, if the British don't maintain war spite because of her emotional contacts, they're not going to sack something. Uh, uh, they're not going to get rid of something early because of emotional contact. 4 say one Checking my copy of Pavel Provok's Russian Strategic Nuclear Forces, the only Soviet ballistic missile service at the point are the R R R5M S3. 48 deployed from 1956-1957. Yeah, I'm not... The ballistic missile forces are not things I'm actually talking about in this one. They're not things to worry about. There is something which is quite worrying to worry... Uh, there is something quite interesting to worry about from a modern perspective, but it's not the ballistic missile. I'm glad I could lighten your dangle. Uh, Red's not trusting Red's now. Why would I be? I believe that's to um, Melanie1604's earlier comment that the Russians and the Chinese don't trust each other. Interesting enough, during the Cold War, the Russians and the Chinese actually fielded whole divisions of artillery. And at several points during the Cold War, they it, the border turned hot in disputes, rather like that which India and China are currently experiencing. And they literally managed to make the earth shake with the firepower they deployed. In fact, so much that on one occasion, the Americans thought they were, measure, they were measuring a nuclear bomb test. That was how much artillery, conventional artillery, was being fired at each other. That the Americans thought they were registering a nuclear bomb. Mm. Thomas Vanderfield. First, there was the Stalin Tito split. Then in 1906, the whole camp fell apart with the secret speech by Khrushchev. Uh, and there was the, uh, also the occupation uprising of in the GDR being cursed. Hungary, too? Yeah, there's all sorts of fun things going on, man. Ron Cash, ooh, much hotter than India and China. China and the US had proper border wars. I'm not sure I would say that if I was on out in the on the um India Indo Chinese border at night, I'm not sure I would be saying I'm uh, the the Russians had proper wars. Um frankly I wouldn't like to be there at night. It doesn't seem like a fun place to be hanging around at the moment. The results were brutally uh, suppressed in um, Czechoslovakia and Hungary. So, what is NASA doing? What else is going on at this point? Well, we've already discussed that NASA buys a whole lot of weaponry from the Warsaw Pact nations, which means basically he's buying them from the Soviet Union, because they're not sending them back as their permission. Especially not after what happens to Hungary and Czechoslovakia. So that doesn't, he's doing that whilst also asking the Allies for money. He's asking them for money to build a dam. He's asking them for money to do all sorts of projects, which he, he wants to do with Egypt. He wants to do a major, major projects. NASA 
actually has visions of turning Egypt into a major industrial power. The British just about also force him to do something which he really doesn't want to do. They force him to give up on Egyptian claims to Sudan. He wants to go south. He would like to go south again. That would be an easy way to get a military victory. Go south, take over the Sudan. The British basically go, you do that, you will find our military will be waiting for you, and we will push you back hard. But this is actually why he's been building up the military he's been building up. Not, Although he doesn't like Israel, uh, he has got enough sense to realize that Israel gave everyone a fairly bloody nose in 1948. And they're quite capable of doing it again because they're quite uh, well armed and quite efficient. His own army, he knows he's been in the army. He knows the issues it has within it. So he wants to provide it with an exercise, an opportunity to build a coalescence around it, preferably one which will be successful, in which case Sudan would have been the perfect option. But that stopped. So he is busily playing off everyone against everyone because NASA is not a communist. He's not. Nasser is not anything. He is the purest politician in terms of his political beliefs as you could ever believe. They are Egyptian for Egyptia for Egyptian Egypt first, and Nasser second, and the people of Egypt third, um, probably in his order of structure of things. And that's how he acts, and that's what he's fair. That's his policy. He's doing everything he can to put do Egypt first. The trouble is, he does again, tend to overestimate his power and influence on events. And he does gamble. It's like most politicians of his type, he does gamble tremendously. There are so many gambles he does which go wrong. And let's be honest, the Suez Crisis could have been one which went very wrong. If the Americans hadn't decided to intervene when they did, and in the way they did, it could have gone very wrong. And actually... There is a flip side, because I honestly have a feeling if it hadn't been Anthony Eden in charge of Britain, if it had been had someone of far more statesmanlike, global statesmanlike persona, and I'm not suggesting Churchill, but if there be, there are a few others of the ilk, if they'd been alive and available, if, you know, Mountbatten famously claims he was against the uh, the Egypt uh, the Suez crisis and the involvement in Suez and was going to resign. He's very quickly persuaded not to resign. I think he's more against it because he's not in charge of it. That's Mountbatten's biggest problem. He's not being put in charge of it. It's being done as a joint Anglo-French operation, and actually the army is running quite a large chunk of it. The Navy are providing a bulk of the air support. And as you can see, we have Seahawks and we have Hunters um, based from the carriers. It is a repeat of Korea in that the closest, most easily available air support at both ends, and remember this is the critical thing, at both ends of the operation comes from the carriers. Hmm. Let's see, just checking the questions out. Uh, that was good. NASA is doing what an independent Middle Eastern African country has to do to survive in the 50s. Pretty much, yes. I, I agree. I think... <sighs> You see, it's very easy sitting here at my desk, looking back in history and going, well, this is what I think, reading forward, I, you should have done. But I also think, again, with NASA, Anthony Eden handles him incredibly badly. Anthony Eden is actually very good at managing many, many relations in the, far, in the Middle East and the Far East, 
But for some reason, when it comes to NASA, he doesn't understand how to deal with him at all. And I honestly think that in many ways, the price for funding the dam should have been considered the cost of doing business. Uh, for Keith, I think, because I think if the British had just decided that they were going to fund the dam, and then considering the other projects they're quite happy to fund in Egypt, deciding they're not going to fund the dam seems a bit like it's a personal argument with NASA. It's basically trying to undermine him directly. Whereas I'd have undermined him indirectly by saying, yes, we'll give you the money for it, but you've got to involve a British engineering company to make sure it all works. Which, honestly, he'd have probably ended up having to go on with, because having a British engineering firm would have probably helped. Dev Squad, Tom saying, the Western powers had told the Hungarians they would intervene to support any revolution, much like they told the Marsh Arabs that they would support a revolution versus Saddam. Always beware of diplomats telling people they'll support stuff. Modern Ukraine, good example. Martin, look, how much of Eden's issues in, in the issues in the decision are down to the much vaunted botch up, uh, botched op he had in the US? <sighs> Eden would have been a very good prime minister in the 1920s. Some people get stronger and better with age. Some people peak. I think Eden peaked about 1950. I honestly do. I think possibly peaked even earlier than that, possibly during World War II. And I think part of the trouble for Britain at this point is that a lot of the generation who had run Britain during World War II were still running Britain in World War II uh, after World War II, and they had used up so much of their energy. Running a world war is a very different thing. It's one of the reasons why I think Churchill gets a lot of flack for his second premiership, but actually he doesn't do that badly. Yes, it's not the same as his wartime premiership, and it's far more complicated for him, but also I think that's because he's older and he's lost their energy again because they're using it during World War II. You know, one of the quite interesting things I give is that... Okay, let's look at it currently. You all have different views on the politics, and I don't want to get into the political debate. But the current political leaders of the world, not a single one who has been running their country during COVID looks like they haven't aged about a 10 years in the last year. Every single one looks or looks so much older, looks so much tireder, looks like they've been constantly working up late and doing all these things. It's one of the interesting, you know, scenarios you get with some of the stuff that comes out in papers about various political leaders when they're attacking them. So they all look tired. Well, this is the generation which has gone through World War II, which has had that for six or so years, which has had to make terrible decisions, and they're still in charge. 10 years later. King's Rook, how much support could um, NATO provide to Hungary with Britain's and France actions in Suez? Well, that is part of the problem, because if you piss off Britain and France, they are the local reaction forces. Again, the American forces are great, but they're all based mo um, based the other side of the world or in Germany. They haven't got any reaction forces. The reaction forces in Europe are British and French. If you upset them, as you do over Suez, the British could have supplied another reaction force. They could have done it. It would have been expensive, but honestly, the thing that that would have been quite easy for the Americans to deal with if the British had wanted, if the British had been prepared to do it. The Americans would have just written a blank check like they did in World War II at various points. 
that would be the easiest way to do it. Oh, you guys need it? Well, here's the money. Go off and, you know, buy the fuel and whatever you need to do. But no. Hello, Niazza. Uh, Carl, ask me that question again at the end, the one about China and India. William Cox, we discussed it a bit earlier. Britain, France, China are up to their necks in Africa to say. Yep, they are. Carmen Guzman, look at it from reverse. If Suez goes hot and both East Germany, Poland, Hungary, and Germany and Hungary get some help, in from Yugoslavia, odds with the OSR, and how the the Finn, the Red Army can stretch? That's the thing. Yeah, King's Rook is right, it's not as thin as NATO, on fact, but also there's the infrastructure. Uh, you have to remember at this point, the a lot of the infrastructure in Eastern Europe is wiped out during World War II. And the infrastructure in Western Europe is rebuilt far quicker than that in Eastern Europe. So honestly, I would say up until mid-1960s, the Soviet forces on the Warsaw Pact and land forces are a bit of a paper tiger. Because yes, they have numbers to force it, but they can't actually get them to where they need to go. They all have to come down very few roads and few railways. And if I was the NATO command, it's just a case of, there is a bridge. Make sure there isn't a bridge. Nihasa, Eden facilitated so much during the 1930s that he's at times supported Chamberlain and then weakly ha we can resigns, which reminds what he was trying to achieve. Yeah, I said. Eden has. Yeah, I. I no. I, Eden tries his best. He looks good. He looks like a dapper politician should, but he isn't the one who should be in charge. Although I would point out that actually the leader of the opposition at several points basically says he would do the same thing as Eden's going to do. Ryan Cash, but you're right. That's why Iran goes one way. The UK and US commit Roosevelt. Flip it back to the Shah, and then they are so naffed if it goes back over the other side harder. Yeah, it, it's fun times. That's good. It's difficult to tell if Putin ages at all. Covered our voice. Yeah. Take care, Yankee Clipper. Thomas Vandervelt, I've seen pictures of my father in 1940-45. He's just 25 years old, but looks like he's aged 30 years. This is the point about when we're talking about the countries in Europe and to an extent America and the Soviet Union in the 1950s and 60s. And we're talking about their political leadership. They're just tired. They are tired. And we have to start, we have to be honest about that. You can't you can't tell me you can go through six years of running a world war, of doing all the pressure that comes with that, and come out of it the other side intact. You know, I, uh, the Admiral I talk about so often from the 1930s, Admiral Henderson, he does six years as third sea lord and basically conks out at the end. He dies because of exhaustion, because of the hours he's been working. And that was in the peacetime. He was going home. At least he wasn't getting bombed. So, here's the thing. The trouble with for Eden is he's always trying to be Churchill. I.e., the guy on the right. Who, by this point, is looking, well, like he possibly could do with doing a bit of exercise. And I, I, I love Churchill. I have to sympathize. He and I both have share the thing that if we do not stop exercising and stop being active, our bellies immediately grow. Um, but honestly, it happens. Eden looks very dapper. He looks lovely, but 
the actual the quotes I have here, and I actually specifically went and hunted down the book to check that I had the quotes right. But these are also quotes you can find on Wikipedia because I wanted them to be easily findable by all of you. Are from Hugh Gateskill, who's the leader of the opposition this time. It's all very familiar. It is exactly the same that we encountered from Mussolini and Hitler in those years before the war. That's what he's saying about NASA. And on the 10th of August, he wrote, writes a letter to, um, uh, to um, Eden saying this. Lest there should be any doubt in your mind about my personal attitude, let me say that I cannot regard an armed attack in Egypt by ourselves and the French as justified by anything which NASA has done so far as consistent with the Charter of the United Nations. Nor, in my opinion, would such an attack be justified in order to impose a system of international control over the canal, desirable though this is. It, of course, the, the whole matter were to, if, of course, the whole matter be taken to the United Nations, and if Egypt were to be condemned by them as aggressors, then, of course, the position would be very different. And if further action, which amounted to obvious aggression by Egypt, were taken by NASA, then again it would be different. So far, what NASA has done amounts to a threat, a grave threat to us and others, which certainly cannot be ignored, but is only a threat, not, in my point, opinion, justifying retaliation by war. That is the leader of the opposition. And his earlier car, that is when he's walking back his position. So that's quite a bit walked back from what it was in July when he was basically predicting war and spritting bricks. Melanie, 16040. Did the Americans just write a blank check model too? I thought that um, uh, they just opened the 99-year lease shop and the UK uh, let the UK show shopping. It, for certain operations, they basically write a blank check. For example, there are parts of D-Day, etc., where the British are putting in quite a lot of money and the Americans are putting in a lot of money, but the Americans need the British to do a lot of things for them, and the Americans basically go, build it, and then tell us how much it costs afterwards. And it works as far as the British are concerned. So, yes, there is the Lend-Lease and there's all those sort of things going on as well. But there are some other things. Um, shoot me. What bridge, sir? Exactly. Uh, Inca, I think that seems unlikely President to have such a falling out with our European allies. He really didn't want to, and as I keep saying, he did know what was going on. And we are doing sewers. So, this is the sewers crisis in 1956, and yes, we are covering things, but as I said, this is the seminar style, and there's going to be a long patrol produced on this. Derp Squad, you're not getting me to say it. Um... Angus Asano, looking into one of my grandfather's service records, he spent most of his time in Europe rebuilding broken bridges. That was pretty much what most of 1945 to 1952 was for the British Army. Yes, oh, he's known as one of the most high-born politicians age. He's well-dressed, had impeccable educational background, and could speak on a wide variety of topics authoritatively. And he had been wounded in war and had got lots of medals. He's He is not a coward. He is not a bad guy. He's just not up to the task. Skip it off, guys. Hello. Thank you. Just got unconditional acceptance. You just played with Plymouth. I will write on the anti-war in the Washington Treaty. Cool. Your wife took you for your first Yorkshire pudding. That is a momentous occasion. I know getting in to do the PhD is important too, and I did it there. But your first Yorkshire pudding is a big one. I, I know that's off topic, but kudos.
<laughs> oh. Thomas de Ver, Van de Ver, I thought Eden was Labour. Okay, that explains why the nuclear big push of the Eden. Yeah, he's conservative. Deskwood, Churchill always needed a bit of exercise. He was also repeatedly drunk, visibly so in Parliament. Yeah, the, the trouble is, Churchill wasn't so much visibly drunk as sometimes he was just visibly annoyed. Um, Churchill was always drunk. I, I For me, it's iron brew. For Churchill, it's scotch. And if Churchill saw this amount of scotch coming towards him, he'd think that's breakfast. Yeah, of course, Gatskill never becomes MP, uh, PM, so his word is moot. No, but it's kind of interesting to consider that the leader of the opposition is actually not that far from the government's position as well. <laughs> so, Thompson, not just uh, not just uh, Churchill and yourself. I've lost half a stone since starting work two days a week. It, think, think I'll need to start eating more. Good for you, but do start eating more. Try some uh, Yorkshire pudding. <laughs> this is why Churchill wears boiler suits, not three piece suits. Yes, definitely. But I, I found this picture and I just thought that's a cool one for them. Ian Carr, what I found interesting I have to admit, about the Gateskill argument is that it mirrors so much of the modern thinking, i.e. if you consider what dominated labour policy in the law from 2001 onwards, from 1990 onwards, it was always to get the UN Security Council, to get the UN, all these things to sort of sign up to it. International connection. It is a very modern approach in many ways to it. It's a post World War II modern approach, but it also shows that when people say, "Oh, this is a new idea," doesn't it? It's not a new idea. It's been around for a while, and it's worked into our conscience. Melina sixteen oh forty. So a blank check and the ninety nine year lease drop. Yeah, pretty much. Um, take care, Dot Squad. So, Dan Freeman, Scooby of Cross. I can recommend the Yorkshire Roast Company, who have a few places in York, and I think one in Salisbury. Have come over, but it still there's a lack in in lack in New York of Yorkshire. So that's terrible. Seems a problem. Right? Also, there's always Toby Carveries, which are quite good. Now, this is what happens. The Suez Crisis, it does go hot. And as we've been over, people do die far more on the Egyptian side than the Allied side. There are several interesting operations. There's the fact that the first Heliborn assault takes place going into a soccer stadium. There are all sorts of things which take place in the Suez Crisis which would be considered de rigueur today, but are really the, the nascent fingers of how war develops. And the Egyptian forces are completely overwhelmed. They do put up a tough resistance. They do their best. They fight very, very hard. But they're not only facing a technological overmatch, they're facing the remnants of the force which fought World War II, i.e. a large chunk of the leadership, a large chunk of the senior NCOs, a large chunk of the, the junior, the middle-ranking NCOs and middle officers, and even some of the juniors, because um, R&R &R and reservists are activated, are World War II experienced personnel. They know about fighting. They've seen it on first hand. They call in firepower. They are not. They have none of these notions of making it fair or anything like that. They will use every advantage they have, and they do so. Uh, 
Uh, no. Uh, skip here, I've Thanks, Doctor. After all this now is in Nine Brew, I was told at the pub that they have this in the Bronx. After that, I die happy. No, don't die happy. Live happy. That's what you do with Iron Brew. You live happy. Jane, with the loss of potential replacement leaders of our country during World War II and the aftermath thereof left us with saying, uh, the same name and faces. Not just loss of potential leaders in terms of their dying. Loss of potential leaders in terms of them being worn out and not wanting to do it anymore. Them just wanting a peaceful, quiet life at home. So many of our best and brightest from all sides of the political spectrum. After World War II, get home and they just want to write books and retire peacefully. Pot around the garden. Not have to deal with that pressure anymore because they've had so many years of such high pressure. Jeff Eiler, what was the effect of Suez on Britain's false dawn in the 1950s when it appeared they had bounced back a World War II? Referencing the people's history of Great Britain post World War II. The Suez is critical for Britain's links to the Far East. This is what you have to imagine, okay? So, we always treat the Cold War as a war focused on Europe. When you're in the 1950s, when you're in, like, there's Korea, there's all sorts of things going on, which Britain is a major part of. How do the troops, how do the aircraft, how do all the personnel get to Britain, get from Britain to Korea? They go through the Suez Canal. How's Britain going to secure and protect Australia? How's Britain going to secure and protect New Zealand? How's Britain going to secure and live up to its, its pledges of support to Ceylon at the time, Sri Lanka as it becomes, or to the Middle East? Through the Suez Canal. It's the same for the French. How are they going to get the Vietnam? It's through the Suez Canal. This is the thing. When NASA, NASA is viewing the Suez Canal almost as an economic project, for Britain and France, the Suez Canal is a strategically vital lifeline. They can't view it as just an economic project. It isn't. Ron Cash, how dare you say scotch? Churchill drank champagne only before midday. Well, yes, okay, yes, champagne. Him and the Queen Mum. And Ian Carr, UN was involved in the Korean War. Yes, it was. But the UN and the Korean War was pretty much um, the Anglophone allies on one side and the uh, Communist Pact allies on the other side. Happy birthday to Carl Harman's dad. Brown Cash, is there much in the way of coastal gunnery protecting the mouth sewers? Not really, but one of the interesting things is when they are taking part and all these the damage is done with four and a half inch guns, they managed to make the decision not to use the cruisers or the battleships to do the fire support. They're just using four and a half inch guns, which may explain why seven out of eight of the daring class and eight of the 24 battle class destroyers turn up. In fact, I have to say, if the publishers ask me to add, add it in, because I've got it ready, I've got a sewers section to go into the book. Because the raw, it, this is really a, very much an operation led by the Royal Navy's destroyer force, which provide the fire support and a lot of the operations. The CIA, why have you referenced me? 
well, hello to CIA. Um, it's mainly because the CIA uh, were talking about the government organization, I hope. Dan Freeman, what is the phrase about a fair fight? Never let yourself be caught in one? Uh, I thought it was also the phrase of what uh, who brought the gun to the sort of the knife fight, the winner. Jason Sparrows, greetings. Nice little catch and actually live on the segment once. Well, thank you. Thomas Van der Velde, they fought over the Egyptian canal, even the 18th century, with Napoleon's campaigns. So the importance of the area goes way back in history. Um, Napoleon's campaigns were, I'm fairly sure, pre-canal. I'd have to check that because my, uh, you know, I, I want to be sure before I say it, but um, I'm fairly sure he's dead by the time the Suez Canal is built. Let's see. Yeah. Built between 1859 and 1869. Officially opened in 1869. It makes the world that much closer. Matt Hand Production. Hello, just finished work, so forgive me if questions have already been uncovered. Don't worry. Uh, Carmen, maybe they wanted quick firing, accurate fire support. Well, yes, to an extent, that's why they were using the destroyers and the 4.5 inch guns, but also they were hoping that using the 4.5 inch guns would reduce civilian casualties. The British were very keen to minimize civilian casualties, and they went out there and proposed quite a lot of restrictions on various operations to try and reduce civilian casualties. In car, have you listed the uh, uh, have you listed the Suez fleet components? Yes. But here are some initial stats. Third Commando Brigade from the Navy, seven of eight Daring Class Destroyers, eight of 24 Battle Class Destroyers, four cruisers and HMS Manxman. The aircraft carriers Albion, Bulwark, Eagle, Ocean and Theseus. Along with aircraft forming a majority of 16 squadrons from the fleet air arm alone. And a oh, near, about 112 ships is my maths of the actual production that they actually take uh, with them. But here is a list of some destroyers. We have Chieftain, Chevron, Chaplet, Daring, Amada, Barfler, Gravelines, St. Kitts, Alamein, Corona, Barossa, Agincourt, Cavendish. Then we have Childers, Comet, Contest, Decoy, Defender, Delight, Diana, Diamond, Duchess, Crane, no, no, Crane's a sloop. Um, then we have terms that we have frigates, we have fifth and sixth frigate squadrons, so that's Wakeful, Whirlwind, Willard, Undine, Arania, the Ulysses, and Ursa. Uh, we also have some sloops, Crane, Modest, Mion, uh, Mion's a frigate. Submarines involved. Uh, the Royal Navy is mainly providing Seahawks, um, De Havilland Sea Venoms. A fair no large number of and whirlings, but also some Douglas Sky Raiders turn up for the fun. And various Westland Wyverns, Whirlwinds, and Sycamores. That is the Bristol Sycamore, which is a very interesting helicopter. If you want to look up for what is the possibly the helicopter that looks most like the Blackburn Blackburn, you have got to look up the Bristol Sycamore. 
And that's just the Royal Navy's things. Uh, the cruisers involved included Bermuda, Ceylon, Jamaica, and Newfoundland, with HMNZS Royalist um, operating with the carrier group as a radar picket until the 2nd of November, ordered not to take part in any operations, but still stays close. The French supply the Jean Bart, the aircraft carrier Lafayette, and Ramaches. So it's seven aircraft carriers in total. Um, they're carrying 36 Vought F4U Corsairs. And the 10th Parachute Division, mainly. Uh, the British Army, well, they've got the Gordon Highlanders, the Cheshire Regiment, the Parachute Regiment, the 6th Royal Tank Regiment, the Gurkha Independent Parachute Company, the 1st Royal Dragoons, the Royal West Kent Regiment, the Royal Scots, the Royal Fusiliers, the Oxford and Buckinghamshire Light Infantry, the Highland Light Infantry, the Argyll and Southern Highlanders, the York and Lancashire Regiment, the Royal Warwickshire Regiment, the West Yorkshire Regiment, the Royal Berkshire Regiment, the Grenadier Guards, only for a battalion and it's only a machine gun platoon only. The Royal Artillery provides several units. Plus, of course, Royal Engineers, RMP, Royal Electrical and Mechanical Engineers, Royal Signals, Royal Army Ordnance Corps, Royal Pioneer Corps, and Royal Army Service Corps. Eh, you have a large number of troops turning up. You have a large number of everything turning up. I'll be back in a second. I just heard banging out the door. Sort of banging on the door you can get behind. Pack of swell bars arrive. So, um, let's see. In happy note, Jean Bart has only one main turret and one secondary turret and half his air battery in commission. The other arm was muffled. Agreed, but still, she's there. Any Welsh regiments involved in Suez, or were they covering Germany? Um, no, they all seem to be Scottish and English regiments, and technically, but I'm fairly sure some Welshmen were there. It'd be a, a drift beer. How profitable were the colonies other than India? Colonies never are that profitable in terms of actually administering them. They can be quite profitable in terms of the trade and the 
resources you gain and the markets you capture. So it all depends on where you put where you actually do your sums as whether they're profitable or not. In car, no RN battleships in the fleet. No, because the RN had decided they were going to use their destroyers to do it. Carl Gaswin. No, it's fairly average compared to the MI1, MI2, or the Cavmos. I'm just saying for something which compares to the Blackburn, Blackburn. But uh, Bud Guy eight eight two nine. What did the USN have in the area? Not that much during the actual crisis. They start basing more in the area afterwards. Jaguar, is there much info on any mine warfare units of Suez? Yes, there was. I can list them for you. They, of course, took the mine layer HMS Manxman, but they also had the net layers Barnstone and Ballon, and the minesweepers HMS Appleton, Darleston, Lederston, Leverton, and Penston. And again, tank landing ships. That's why it's so funny. It's so funny when people go, "No one in America knew what the British were doing." They've even got a landing craft repair ship, HMMRC, what ten ninety seven going along. Tank landing ships. They've got Anzio, Bastion, Buttress, Citadel, Counterguard. Evan Gibb, Empire Simric, Empire Cedric, Empire Celtic, Empire Doric, Lofoten, Lof Loftus, Empire Baltic, Portcullis, Parapet, Puncher, Rampart, Ravenger, Redoubt, Striker, Reggio, Sallyport, Salerno, and Silva. And civilian auxiliary ships taken up from trade. Asania, Asturus, Astura. Dispenser, Devaria, Empire Fowey, Empire Gallic, Empire Ken, Empire Pankston, Energy, SS Kingsbury, New Australia, and Salinas. I'm not sure about you, but that sounds like a lot of ships to suddenly be taking up from trade. Oh, we have a nice map come up of some of the operation. Yes, this is Port Said, and this is what happens to it. Basically, it gets... Hello, we're here. We'd rather like to take control of you. Uh, you're unhappy about this? Well... I'm Doc. My uncle's at Suez. Hmm, cool. Night Heron Production. Had HMS Vanguard... Had a Vanguard been in commission and not in reserve, am I right in thinking her deployment would have been highly unlikely? Considering the British had decided to use 4.5-inch guns and had only taken the cruisers along as if problems really get heavy, then we can fire them. But, no. Manly 1640. He did, uh, did Jean Bart ever uh, have both uh, both ba uh, battery, main bar battery turrets operational? I don't think she did. Ron Cash, look at United Fruit Company, sounds innocent, but was huge investor in balance of trade benefit for US in the 50s. Also had Alan and John Foster duels on the board, led to a few coups. Hmm.
Sean Mack, it seems like a similar to US during the Falklands, except that they sided against the British in this one. There are some similarities. Ian Carr, LSD's named by this guy in time. Yes, they were. Engage your strategy. Hello. Uh, in Habby, William Reculo was the US refused refitting JB despite free, uh, French proposals. Yeah. Mainly because the French were expecting a lot of bang for their buck for refitting the Jean Bart. I would say it's not just the timing for the operation is decided by the the Israelis need for time to prepare, the French need for time to prepare, the time need to hire things, and the onset of the Mediterranean winter. Which was felt would make it impossible. Melanie, sitting happy. Was it Rikulu or Jean Bart that spent World War II somewhere in North Africa with a single main battery operation at Tarot Orchard? I think that was Rikulu. Okay, I get the whole hearts and minds thing. Come on. We just had won a world war by having to not hold back. Why in the name of all this? Doing this with one hand tied is mainly because the fact is that this is the Cold War context. There is a lot of Cold War context going on over the Suez Crisis. That's one of the reasons why I say if NASA had fallen, the Americans would not have been opposed to what had happened. Mainly because, as said, he's flirting too much with the other side, but there's no easy way to get rid of him, and the American efforts to recruit or manage him have proved faultless, uh, but also they're not really understanding what's going on in terms of they have people on the ground who do know what's going on and do understand the scenario. But there seems to be almost, and this is repeated again, you can say in the Falk, run up to Falklands War, where you have the people on the ground in Argentina, etc., telling the British government, this is what's going on, this is what's happening, listen to us. The British government going, oh, no, no, we don't believe that, we don't believe that, we don't believe that, we don't believe that, and that's not happening, that can't be happening, da 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 using their vaunted experience, and then war happens. And it's the same with a lot of what's happening in Egypt at this point, and the Middle East at this point with the Americans. Because the Americans are focused on the Cold War and fighting communists. And they honestly don't really see what else is gone to extra other threats they could be coming on. Um, Gopherbrook24. I thought Richelieu was pronounced Richelieu. Have I been pronouncing Richelieu? Sorry. I was having a conversation the other day with someone who kept pronouncing it that way, and now I'm picking up the pronouncing. Do you think there is any mileage in the idea that the delays due to the need to activate reserve and regular forces to do maximum meant that the Britain and France lost the international initiative? I think that if they had responded quick and more quickly, they could have set the tone. But I also think there was that's from problem when you're doing revised versus musketeer if you've done revised from the beginning you could have done it far quicker but i still think they'd have needed to get quite a lot of ships out of reserve and out of the mothball fleet and quite a lot of forces to be able to do it and that was half the trouble because the forces had been wound down post korea and were then had to be wound up again
Just being interesting to compare FA Seahawks to RF Hunters, first gen versus second gen. Uh, why were they so far behind? It takes long. It takes a while to develop these things. Plus, to an extent, it's what you're deploying able to deploy to the area. Remember, this is also the period the British have really started development on things like the Buccaneer, etc., and the Civics, and they just haven't come into service yet. And up till a few years ago, if you consider sort of 1956, we're talking about an all-jet force in the Korean War, you have got Furies, Sea Furies, doing quite most of the flying and being critical to it. And even, I think, you know, various other types of aircraft sort of like that. So it's, it's, a, it's been an emerging thing. Jets are getting there, but it's getting them into service. Kahaman, did crisis last till 56, or what was happening between 53 and 56? Between 53 and 56, the crisis was sort of building up. It happened technically in 56, but there's a lot of stuff happening before it. Nighttime reduction. What would be the post Suez ramifications for the French and Royal Navies have been? Had the Americans not intervened, and the operation was successfully overall, and not just military, not just militarily. If it had been successful, then Britain and France are back on the world stage as global, independent global powers. That's the thing. The moment they do that and pull it off, they are do are by definition independent global powers. Yes, they might have had tacit American support and approval, but and pretty much it's kind of. You could almost say it's a Falklands War scenario in terms of Britain coming to the world and going, actually, you know what, we are capable of independent action, we are capable of doing this, and we all know about the level of support the Americans gave in the Falklands War. It was incredibly useful. And without it, the war would certainly have been far more costly for the British. But And it's the same with Suez. And this is where the scenario of today is one of it going hot. Basically, the idea is, what? how would it go hot? Well, I'll talk you through this. So, under the Cold War scenario, while sanctions to the USA were likely, an actual military involvement wasn't. The Americans really weren't in a position to do it at that point and didn't want to do it at the point. They had had they had too many other commitments going on around the world and it would require too many military forces. Plus, if they're facing off against the Soviet Union, beating up their two biggest allies was not really good for them to go, even if they could guarantee they could do it. So it means to go hot has to involve the other superpower, the Soviet Union. And also, it means if they wanted to do it as well, the USA, and I don't think they would have. They were wanting to uh, to publicly rein the French and the British in after they decided it wasn't working out successfully for them. If it worked out successfully for them, they would have been quite happy to support it. The question is, if the Soviets decide to do anything, would the USA get involved? That's a legitimate question, which we'll get into. Considering the preponderance of Anglo-French naval task force versus the realistic capabilities of the Soviet Navy this time, I'm thinking it goes to bombers and its bombing attack. And then you've got American air ba base in the UK, could well be hit by mistake. So this is my pointing. So we're thinking of, if it goes hot, if the Soviets decide to get involved, their probable get action, route of action will be bombing. And if they're doing bombing, then they are probably going to hit something they don't want to hit.
Martin Dock, do you care to get Pickfords to transport Centurion to the ports due to lack of tank transporters in the UK? They had to get a range of companies involved for that one as well, yeah. William Cox, World War II was a long time gone. In 56, LSTs and victory ships were aging rapidly and many have been scrapped. Most of the rest of Liberty and victory ships were in civilian hands. True. I think someone said that earlier. Um, on Dock, Dr. Clark, do you think it was a mistake to not use the UK forces based in Libya to overthrow NASA? along with a slimmed-down invasion force. I don't think there were enough British forces based in Libya to do that. And I think if they had done it, they would have had to reinforce them all to do it. Ron Cash, I'm trying to be good at stand subject, but now my distation subject of the Belgian Congo gets raised. You are triggering me. Come on. Um, there are Welsh units around, but I'm fairly... <laughs> There are limited forces actually used. They could have used more, though. And honestly, if they had used more, they'd have probably made it even more quickly. Uh, 900 production. I see a thing of you again. Forgive if I'm taking a, uh, talking over uh, uh, ground already covered. I'm here late. But I don't see the actual question. That's the trouble. Um... Uh, sure, Mac. I'm right in saying the US attitude about this was, yeah, you can do that. Just make sure you do it right and we won't complain. That's pretty much my suspicion from the books I've been reading and the, you know, the, the discussions I've been having with people. It's... Very quickly, I came down to the idea that for them to have not known, they would have to be very willfully angry. I think... Um... Melanie 16040 basically said so they'd had to have worked in offices without windows and been driving around the UK with blinkers on. It's it's virtually impossible for them not to have known. And that's before you get on the number of British officers and American officers and British personnel, American personnel, civilians, all things, who knew, who were friends, who would have chatted with their American counterpart and given them a heads up. Man needs 16040. What, so what the UK French need was some unhappy Egyptian citizen with a pistol and access to NASA. Pretty much. Trust me, the British would have loved that one. Suez is the start of Canada's attempt to be a middle power separate from the UK. Pearson creates the first US peacekeeping force and is deployed uh, UN, uh, peacekeeping force and it's deployed until 1967. Um, yes, again with Canada, I wouldn't... <sighs> A again, with Canada, they are let Australia and New Zealand are very worried about it. South Africa just keeps quiet. They're kind of supportive of the British, but don't want to get involved in it. And Canada is the only um, power w of the empire which is still looks to Britain for a bit of its security and America for security, but doesn't really depend upon the canal to get access. And that's one re half the reason. The British are. Okay, all the papers I've managed to get on National Archives, they are talking about two things. They're not talking about empire, although that's possibly part of it, but it's not. It's sort of subtext. They are talking about the strategic ability to reinforce Australia, New Zealand, and the Far East, should there be a communist rising again like Korea, and the ability to rapidly get out there. And the fact that NASA, by his unilateral action in taking over it, and by already, the moment he takes over it, already banning certain nations' ships from going through there, in Israel, has set precedents which are problematic. I.e. he could ban other people going through it. And the thing was, you have to remember, the Suez Canal is treated as international waters. That's what has been treated up to, uh, to this point. Hmm. 
We'll get to that. Daniel Freeman, what aircraft with enough range did 1956 Soviet Union Air Force have? Pretty much there is one option, and we'll be getting that. Do you want US Bonham Richard, USN sailors who served it, call it the. So I like to think Jean Bach and Richelieu would also. Uh, Richelieu would be, uh, uh, would be to them the John B and the Big Ricky. Mm hmm. Uh, you should hear what HMS Richmond gets called. Um. Hmm. Martin Nock, Daniel Freeman, did the Soviets not have their copy of the B-29? Yes, or otherwise known as the 2-4, but they do have other aircraft as well. So, F. Thompson, uh, was there very hard, I was trying very, very hard not to get on the political side, but in my opinion, person, uh, Pearson was one of the worst PMs we've ever had. Mm, he was an interesting soul. In Happy, how fast would the Russians be able to deploy bombers, i.e. to the Balkans? Mostly 2-4, I guess. Maybe some brand new 216. Were there suitable airfields available to the Russians in range? There are, theoretically. If you accept their initial... The, the, the trouble is that you have to accept the initial uh, the claimed operating ranges of their aircraft. And we do know how good they get. And as me and Drac often like to say, the fact is the idea that Western superiority was massive over the Russians at all points during the technology sphere was not the case. But it gets interesting. So first, we're going to expand this. This is slightly later, but it gives you a nice idea of some of the forces breakdown and where the forces could come from. So, and I'm not sure why the southern region one, which was put in and is scaled exactly the same and looked fine in the PowerPoint, has not scaled up and looks dull. But there is uh, a lot of various organizations going on around. Division, all the divisions being organized and all the troops being organized between the northern and the southern areas. There are a lot of troops in position, and there are a lot of things already in position in the 1950s. So, again, I point out the infrastructure issues. And we, of course, can always talk about the nuclear weapons issues. But. They are not all conquering. Mm -hmm. Nick Waters, Shomak, Tupelo Design Bureau must have been a bit embarrassed sending out the Boeing with Boeing cast into some components. No. You should hear what happened to design bureaus who failed. It's not nice. Hmm. Right then, let's see. When was, there's no such, uh, lol, there's no such, uh, not such a poles as poles and computers. Analog and digital flow into one another, but in the 50s, analog was sometimes easier for simpler calculations and such used less tubes. Yeah. And now, of course, we're looking back at potentially going with analog again. We'll leave that to one side though. Jack, Bulgaria de Suez in and circa is circa fifteen hundred kilometers over uh, GN cost is uh, sixteen hundred kilometers over Syria. It's not exactly an easy thing for them to do. But remember, airborne early warning 
Not really around at this point. Yes, you have some radar ground stations, but nowhere near the systems you have that you had in World War II on those land bases. So you are going to be dependent on the fleet air defense. Come, my first laptop used Windows Vista. I'm not going to say, my, my, me telling you, saying how, what my first one was reveals my age. Sure, Mike, nobody would exaggerate capability of the equipment on paper, which is why the Ioclos was always cruising around at 35 knots. Yes, I'm presuming that's sarcastic. Right, so here's the Soviet perspective. So why would the Soviets get involved? Well, the Allies are divided and distracted. This would actually make them more divided. They can assert their eminence on the world stage. They can strengthen their position in Europe. They can secure the position in the Middle East. They can claim they're looking like the good guys by acting on Egypt and potentially take the next two most powerful members of NATO off the board for any future conflict by causing sufficient damage that the British and French decide not to get involved in any war with the Soviet Union, potentially breaking up NATO. And technically, if they get involved and the USA decides not to get involved, then they have a run of it. They have a free run. Yes, these are also the two other powers which are developing and have nuclear weapons. So... It's not exactly viable for the Soviet Union to want to go nuclear on this one. But with their conventional arsenal, especially their conventional bomber arsenal, they have quite a long-range striking capability, and they can cause a lot of damage to the British and the French. Plus, these are not the big power. They are the declining imperial powers, especially in the Soviet worldview, guided by World War II, whereas USR has just grown in power. Although, as we all know, USSR has got a lot of issues, legacy of World War II, and is not in a good state. But still, there is a potential, because if they get involved, they've already been moving quite heavily into the Middle East. Their big problems in the Middle East, and this is according to Soviet's, uh, Soviet Union's own intelligence reports, is not the, U uh, the US, which they describe as amateurish and jumping around. But it's actually the work of Britain and France, which is far more potent in the Middle East at this period. They have connections, they have legacy, and they have interests in the region and connections, so they use them a lot. For the Soviet Union, if they could get control, or at least a very powerful position in the Middle East, then they can dominate the fuel supply to Europe at this point. If they can dominate the fuel supply to Europe because they're supplying fuel, the, uh, the Middle Eastern powers are supplying fuel, they can have a full dominant position of OPEC as it becomes. They have the power. And if they have the power, then no one else does. And they can win the Cold War. So, if they could do it without the Americans getting involved and out, without it descending into a general war, it would be a very, very successful operation for them. Now, let's go to the reality check. Because the reality check is, whilst the Soviet Union could do it, they would then be fighting the British and the French, which were not slouches in the military capacity department at this time at all. And honestly... If you want to see how quickly America turns from being very against what you're doing to very pro being what you're doing, you have the Soviet Union get involved. Because if the Soviet Union come to aid NASA, that makes him a communist. That makes him a bad guy. And there are enough Americans who already feel that Britain and France are their traditional friends, enough people who feel that any one of the Soviet Union's enemies uh, is their friend, that the British and French were probably getting a lot of support, if not outright military aid from the Americans. <sighs> I 
Ron Cash, look like the good guys. This is very key in swaying populace and agents in foreign countries. Bribery, blackmail, and ideology are the angles. That is definitely key to what they're going to do for. Ian Carr, UK had gone nuclear in 1952. Yes. Thomas Vanderway, their arsenals were rather wimpy compared to USSR, or at least, let alone the USA at the time. They're not that wimpy, and remember, again, we are talking about everyone can deliver them by bomber aircraft at this point, so... It's not like when you have ballistic missiles and you can pretty much you can say they're going to be so going so fast you can almost guarantee they're going to get through. It is the time when they're bombers and powerful enough radar, fast enough fighters, you might be able to shoot them down. But here is the Soviet arsenal. This is why I don't think their navy gets involved. Because at this point, the Svoldov class are their big hitters of their navy. They don't have the massive submarine fleet they build up. The crucial thing, though, is the same aircraft which pretty much forms the majority of the striking arm. Well, the aircraft based on a variation of the variation of the air variation for, still forms the striking arm of the chinese air force today i'm talking about the 216 badger which is a cool aircraft i like it for its period it's very good and that would have been what would have been flying in the strikes would they have been conventional would have been nuclear I think if the Soviet Union had been playing this properly, they would have gone conventional because going nuclear for this incident would have seen would have lost them any goodwill they'd raised and automatically brought a nuclear response. So they'd have gone for conventional punitive strikes. Think of it like the operations conducted over Yugoslavia as it broke up and that sort of thing. The idea of dropping democracy or peace or whatever you want to say from 20,000 feet. That's what they would have been thinking, and getting involved doing attacks on British forces in Egypt, etc. It would have been a long range, long shot. It wouldn't have been easy, it would have been very difficult. But could they have done it? Yes. What would the impact have been? As I said, the impact of it going hot is a problem. Do the British lose some ships? Do the French lose some ships? Do they get some ports beat up? Do they get some airfields beat up? What happens? What exactly did it take? These are all questions that have to be considered. Hmm. Oh. And Carl McGasper, read 216. With the E Canberra in service from 1951 to 2006, old birds die hard. Actually, what I think it is, is mostly this is almost the last generation of aircraft which are built to be incredibly rugged. And it's kind of, how do I put this? When you're designing something to, it's like carrier-borne aircraft as a whole, but I think this is the last generation of land aircraft. Drac once said a very interesting comment. He put it in a very good way, and I had been thinking about it for a while, but he put it this way best. When he said the actual thing, and because a carrier aircraft is designed to basically do control crashes for its entire operating life, and still operate. Everything has to be built incredibly tough. An aircraft which is designed in a period where they are worried about minimal operation, minimal infrastructure and facilities to operate them from will be designed very, very tough. 
if you're designing an aircraft in a period where you are always presuming it's going to have access to top of the range infrastructure and a nice gentle landing, you don't have to design it so tough, but that means it's not going to last so long. An airframe built to survive the impact of those landings, the impact of those operations, is going to survive a long time because it's built very strong. Um, William Cox, uh, Daniel Freeman and Melanie 16040. Did you know there are cameras still flying in the US? Um, and I think NASA is still using them. Joe, I just had an idea. The slot said the French used airfields in Syria. That made nice half escalating targets for the Soviets. Exactly. There are lots of options for them to go for. So, what happens then? Would the war end up in Germany? This is an interesting question. If there's a war, which is technically started by NASA seizing that, then the British and French going in there to take it back. So, technically doing the actual proper military action aggressively. Technically shouldn't be covered by the NATO treaties. But then if the Soviet Union attacks Britain and France, I can't see America not getting involved at that point. I just can't in this in the Cold War scenario. They're so focused on the Cold War scenario, I can't see them not getting involved. At which point, and you have to start considering this, if the Americans get involved and the British and French are involved... Then the NATO, rest of NATO powers probably get involved quite soon as well because it's going to escalate. Because at a certain point, uh, Russia is going to try and use its bases in Germany to launch the attacks on Britain. That is the primary operating area from which they can probably reach Britain from. You know, reaching Syria is one thing, reaching France, again, you're probably going to need your base in Germany. And if you're doing that, that's probably going to bring West Germany into the war because you're going to be trying to overfly them. And there's going to be the bases, the British and French bases in West Germany, which you might try and hit. So, of all that aside, I think you end up with a general war. Does it go nuclear? I don't think so. I think what would happen is you it would start off very slowly, keep percolating, keep percolating. And I think at some point, considering Khrushchev and Eisenhower's predilections, I think probably Eisenhower would call for peace first. He would offer it, say, there's no point, da -da -da -da, this is all started by NASA doing this and the British and French overreaction. We're, we're all fighting, but we're losing lives over this. It's pointless. And I wouldn't be surprised if the Soviet Union ends up agreeing it is. I think NASA at this point loses his post. I think Eden and French president are probably out of their post as well. But I also think the canal would end up under that international committee, operating under that control of the international committee. Reason being, to stop it ever happening again. That would be the reason given. So for America, that would be a win-win-win. It would be the British and French... And also, the, to an extent, weakened in the Middle East to allow the Americans to try and get it more focused on the Cold War. It would have brought the Cold War home to the Middle East, so hopefully they would get more involved in it. It would, and hopefully on the American side, it would provide international control of a very strategic avenue for moving sources, resources, and it would be peace. But saying that, the only reason that happens is because, honestly, as I've said, I don't think there there is the infrastructure on the east on the eastern side of Germany and the eastern Europe 
to actually move those forces the Soviet Union has, the Soviet Union has amassed to Germany quickly enough. I think they'll be moving, and I think they'll be under air attack a long way. Because their logistics and all these things aren't going great. Jeff Hiller, what does the USA, USA do if the UK and French don't stop? Well, I think they're probably sanctions. Sam Thompson, Dr. Clark, in college, my prof sounded like Nikki from Rush. Jeez, why so heavy? When I was doodling planes out, turned in and said gravel strip, plowing the field, plowed field landings. Their jaws dropped. Yeah, that happens a lot. Carl, uh, Carl Hartman, I find it weird how no major nations have aircraft such as A-29 Super Tanaga. They seem um, handy for rapid deployment and low intensity support air, plus maybe a few for peacekeeping. Basically, they don't have them because they don't need them at the moment. They build them from other people, and Embraer that builds them for many people. And if they needed them, they'd set a production line and start building them quite quickly. Also, they tend to use drones for that sort of operation because it's less risky in terms of humanity. Melanie 16040. One of them, NASA 927, actually holds the record of the longest time in extended storage. 41 years out in the desert in De Davis, Mon Montana, Muffin, and returned to flight. Cool. I presume that's the ongoing extra conversation on the cameras, which are quite cool. Dan Prim, British Army dusts off all maps of Egypt to plan invasion rule. Uh, sorry, support to the new independent Egyptian rule again. What happens with a hot sewers again? It's interesting. Dan Freeman, I re going nuclear? I think not, given Korea hand. That's my inkling as well. I think everyone views nuclear as very much the final option, and pretty much for it to go nuclear, you'd have to be actually invading French soil, British soil, American soil, or Soviet soil. And I'm talking Russian Soviet soil. I'm not talking Polish or East German. Jermak, that sounds like something from Red Storm Rising, but in 1956, Red Khrushchev may not be so strong internally, and other factions may try to take him down because of getting USA into another Cold War. Remember, Khrushchev has done a bloodless coup in his military. He has kicked out a lot of people who were problematic. The fact he didn't kill them like Stalin did, a bloodless purge, earns him a lot of support. Angus Sonner, so what was it to turn this crisis hot? Well, the Suez crisis was turned hot because the British and the French invaded. But, as I've said, in this scenario, what happens is the Soviets decide to get involved. That's the difference. If the Soviets decide to get involved, this is what happens. It turns into a general NATO conflict. Because I think at no I don't think the Americans would not get involved. Don't know. Yep. I think Soviet Union supporting NASA and Egypt while US lets Britain and France get a little bit more loose on the leash. Probably. Mondok, the Russians had just crushed the Budapest uprising. If they try to hit UK and France interactions in the East against Russia in areas not secure. I think that would definitely be a case, but um, the thing is those uprisings had just been severely put down hard. I don't think they're going to turn up that quickly again. Back in a second. Second bottle today. Not really good for me. I do need to start drinking more water. But, in my defence, I am working on the drinking the water thing. It's just the water's over the other side.
Kings Rook, do you think the Suez Crisis could have been solved in a better fashion? Yes, a lot. Honestly, as I said, the best way to have solved the Suez Crisis would be not to have it in the first place. The best way not to have it in the first place would be the British to not have done, to have basically bankrolled NASA in terms of building his, helping him build his dam. Melanie, uh, it's, it's, it's what size bottles? Uh, I've been through about two two litre bottles of Iron Brew, and um, uh, judging by this, this is the second bottle of one, one and a half litre bottle of Highland Springs. So I think I've had a good day drinking wise, but this is the trouble. If you put liquid near me, I will drink it and I just keep drinking. This is why another reason why I don't drink alcohol, because I would just drink it. <sighs> Including Zukov, after him to get rid of the KD and Bera, which did not make Shusha very uh, very popular, and they Krishna very popular, and they used Cuban Missile Crisis failure to get rid of him, I believe. Eh, yes and no. By that point, he wanted to go. He was fed up with the the idiots. See, Mike, um, Dan mm. Freeman, going back a bit, and um, uh, uh, going back a bit, the A29 Super BA prefers it. If possible, people buy the Hawk trainer, which can be adapted for low intensity cast type things. Nah, there's always another option. Well, no, it's really problematic when the red arrows are armed with bombs. My name production. Go back a bit with my question on post Suez ramifications for British and French. I mean, in terms of policy, do conventional carriers have a bit more time in? Uh, in service? <laughs> yes, they do. But also, I'd say if the British, if it is, uh, then you have the British carrier force probably gets another added layer of protection because the Easter Suez policy is probably going to continue. And if the Easter Suez policy continues, then you're going to build your new carriers. Gahaman, I'm back with spaghetti bowl with meatballs and garlic bread and summer fruit cider. Be jealous. Not of the summer fruit cider, but of the rest? Yum. Let's see. See, so rugged carrier planes, reasons Grumman Corp production shops were called the ironworks. Yes, and by gum were the Grumman's uh, uh, thing. Um, Angus Donald, was the dam NASA wanted to make the Aswan Dam? Yes. Environmental, uh, environmental implications be D A M N D. See, my escalating journey. My goodness, Elvis is at risk. Well, you know, you might actually, you never know. If he'd actually been involved in something, it might have actually, um, how'd I put this? Helped him in some respects. Give him an extra layer to play when he's playing, uh, he's in the movies. So, 
just quickly going to add this in. Once again, the CIA has won the vote. We're not quite sure how they keep winning the vote, but they do. It's probably because they produce very good topics. And the trend of air gone hot. How badly would the US Navy have had, I've changed it to, it have been beaten? Mainly because I don't want YouTube to get mad at me. And, you know, that's life. Then, joint second are the effect of the early jet age and how it affected naval warfare strategy tactics, as proposed by Andrew North, which is a rather nice successor to the Suez Crisis, as something to discuss in future and build upon this. Because the jet age and the Suez Crisis do kind of go hand in hand. And the Battle of Sleaze. Is Major General Jesse Fuller correct to declare it one of the Western world's decisive battles, as proposed by Bail in Aura? Now, honorable mention should go to the withdrawal from the east of Suez, 1966, um, 10 years after this war, as proposed by Incar. And Lessons of the Battle of, the Battle of Guadalcanal, by, proposed by Daniel Freeman. And what's the impact if the RN lands, Marines, and retakes Narvik and eventually the Allies save Norway, courtesy of Timothy Sims? All very interesting proposals. But that does mean November will have free patron topics. Manly 1640. Dana Also, A29 is better suited to combat air support versus the likes of the Hawk. Turbo prop tend to be more suitable for mm, the flight regime. That is true. Ah, William Cox, a Pukara with gun pods. Possibly. Possibly. So. Any questions? I hope you've enjoyed that. I'd say I enjoyed researching it, but as I said, it is going to become a long patrol, uh, the video, because I did try originally breaking it up into context, sort of an introduction overview, and then the actual events of what happened in the war, and then the scenario as a sort of free part introduction. And it didn't work because you kept to keep going back, and I found myself... When I realized that I was actually copying and pasting slides between the three different presentations, because they had to be put in, because when I went through it, it had to be put in, I realized more and more that it couldn't be done as that. It had to be done as a section long patrol where I'm going to have little timestamps in the sort of description so people can look at the sections they want to. Angerson, is there a connection between the Yellow Fleet of 1967 and the Suez Crisis? Not really. There is, in terms of the fact they've both got sort of almost similar mission profiles, but not really. Carl Hammond, were any ships stuck in the canal when war happened? Yes, there were, but they were allowed out. No one was blocking the canal. They were fighting the fight for the canal, but not blocking the canal. The canal was pretty much more blocked afterwards, thanks to um, various... Yeah. 
issues. Well, sort of, it's more the case of the um, e Egyptians versus Israelis and the Six Day War and various things which come on later, which cause even more trouble for the Suez Canal. The Suez Canal has a great history of being fought over because it's one of those very strategic positions for maritime affairs, but it's a completely artificial one, like the Panama Canal. And as such, it's actually dominated by the land, whereas if you consider the great strategic positions which are conditionally associated with with history, they're dominated by sea when they're great strategic sea positions. They are points where the sea and the land meet, but the sea can dominate them as equally as the land can, whereas, honestly, the Suez Canal is far easier to dominate it from the land. Same with the Panama Canal. You can literally wheel a tank right up to it. Thomas van der Wiel, did anybody read Donuts' Last Gamble, the Inshore U-Boat Campaign by Lawrence? Totally off topic. Um, basically, looking out for this week's brew ships. You're going to enjoy it. I'd be very happy to help the Trent Affair one, although maybe one to uh, or maybe one to co-produce with someone from the USA. Well, I'm wondering if the CIA would like to get involved, considering they keep winning these votes. They keep setting me up with these great topics. Thank you, son. Doug's clock. I have, I have looked, but then I'm fine. Have you done any of videos on Operation Husky? Not directly on Husky yet. I have done some things about HMS Tarsus' involvement in Operation Tusky when I'm talking about the tribals, battles, and darings, but not yet. I have got... Uh, there's a whole section on Husky in my book, so I could do something on Husky quite easily. William Cox, I-400 on the way to the Panama Canal. Got me free torpedoes and free... Yeah, don't, don't get me started on that. If you want to take out the Panama Canal, as I've been over before, and you can't do this so much on the Suez Canal because it doesn't really have, it doesn't have lock gates, but you load up a couple of liners slash freighters with a whole lot of our explosives. You wait till one of them's in the end, some troops. You blow up the lock gates with one of them, but set it off in the locks. Uh, probably on the Pacific side, because there's it's far more difficult to get in the industry. But if you could set off both sides, that's great. If you can set off one in but uh, them in either side, and you have a second freighter with each one, and troops go off both and destroy all the land facilities around them, because honestly, if they're hidden, you probably won't see them until it's too late, do some destructing, get on the one that's still, the shit that's not blown itself up, and get out of there. And if they do it in night time, they probably would get away. The one on the Pacific side would probably get home to Japan. The one on the Atlantic side uh, would probably run into the Royal Navy or the American Navy in the Caribbean and get a very warm welcome. But it might make it to a neutral nation. Roland Cash, can we stop mentioning the CIA? I'm trying not to go rubber holding. Well, the problem is, Roland. Ah, oh, yeah. The CIA won the vote. Which they traditionally are very good at winning votes of, so, you know. Martin Nock, remember reading that the troops from the 16th Airborne had to turn in their new SLRs for the Enfields for the Suez operation? Well, the Lee Enfields worked well. Danny Freeman, a Canadian might well have a lot of interesting things to say about the British and your empire getting involved in fighting in North America, see, uh, circa 1860s. Yeah, the Canadians would have actually enjoyed it. They were planning on getting some land back at one point. 
and the Americans did keep threatening to invade Canada because actually so, uh, several Americans, I think Staten, the most, most senior one, the, uh, oh, what's it called, the Secretary of State, believed that by starting a war with Britain, uh, the southern states would rejoin to fight the war as they were brought together by patriotism. So only later in uh, later in the war he realized that actually what that would have done is they'd have sided with Britain and Britain would have beaten us up at sea, and they'd have let them beat us up at land because that was beat. That's how Britain fights its wars historically. Its navy beats up your navy, and it uses its economic power to supply and arm another nation's land army to do the messy land fighting bit. Ian Carr, how did HMS Jellico command from HMS Iron Duke, 8th uh, battle line at uh, Jutland, um, by basically a lot of flag, uh, flag work and radios when they'd work? Uh, Roland Boyd, there are a lot of uh, lots of burned out tanks all along the canal. Yes, they had like that fighting. Uh, Thomas Manor, brew ships. I'm totally new to this game. Brew ship, uh, Thomas Manor, brew ships is my Sunday book review show. So basically, every Sunday I review books, and at the moment, I have for, I think this Sunday's the new episode, it's um, this one from Drac, Falkland Islands, by Paul Morrison. We have Andrew Boyd, The Royal Navy's Eastern Waters, uh, Lynchpin of Victory. Hitler's Attack U-Boats, The Kriegsmarine's World War II Submarine Strike Force by Jack P. Malam Shaw. British Naval Intelligence Through the 20th Century by Andrew Boyd, which is why we have the Andrew Boyd, the Eastern one, because frankly, you need to read the Andrew Boyd stuff together. We have John Jordan's Washington Warships After Washington. Then we have Warships After London, also by John Jordan, the end of the Treaty Era. Britain and the Ocean Road, Shipwrecks and People, A1927-1825 by Ian Friel. And the Kaiser's U-Boat Assault on America. All these books have been sent to me. They're brand new and they've been sent to me by Penn and Barring this one, which was sent to me by Drac. But, um, yeah. It's a good... It, it, there's some interesting books. So, very nicely, because as you, I said, I often do book reviews, and basically, I was chatting away with Pen and Sword about my own book going into them, and they said, "Oh, you're doing you you do book reviews on your YouTube channel, don't you?" Yes, I do. Would you like some books sent to you? We've got some new releases. Yes, please. I have a feeling after seeing that collection, Drac is also possibly going to be starting a book review episodes at some point. Okay. Uh, right then, looking at it, uh, one of UK and France problems in 1956, they didn't have a reliable proxy to deal with NASA. That's the truth. They needed someone local to do it. Manly 1640, care to speculate on sort of missions NASA might have for a flying a camera over in Afghanistan in 2006, 2010, and 2011? Well, I'd say it's a very, very sensitive aircraft with a lot of very high-tech gear on it, which I'm sure is all pointed spacewards to monitor satellites and low-Earth orbit activity. But um, you never know what it might pick up just randomly flying over certain areas. It's being guided by the science. Daniel Freeman, Thomas Vanderbilt, Brew Ships is when Dr. talks about books while drinking iron brew and continues until he runs out of iron brew and or books. 
Mm, pretty much. Or until sometimes until the fluffy research assistant asked me to go and uh, walk him. New IKB 4472. Seems like the USA should have let the UK and France have the Middle East. Possibly it would have been sensible in this period. It's just that 6 o'clock on a Sunday. Uh, Thomas Van der Veen, it's on YouTube. <laughs> Kahaman, when will you be equal and feature FBI? Well, when the FBI start proposing articles. Mm -hmm. Martin Dock, in 1954, the UK had 82,000 troops based in the Canal Zone. If they'd still had those troops based there in 1956, I think NASA might have had to change his opinion of what he's going to do. Okay, Sam P. Harris. Got invited to this today by a friend. First time ever. This is really fun. I'm glad it's fun. Basically, what I do, and as I've said this before, I do introduction videos or long patrols, which are sort of the lectures. If it's an introduction video, it's if I can change the subject, uh, if I can put the subject into multiple parts, so make it easily digestible. It's a long patrol if it's something which is going to be a longer lecture, which really doesn't work, is broken up into parts. And then the lives are the seminars. So they're about discussions, they're going working through the topic, but they're very much a question and answer session. So they're it's it's university style, because I'm a university lecturer. I know some people go, this is not how they like it, it's not what they use, and I go, that's fine. That's if you don't like it, you, I'm not forcing you to watch it. But the way I run it is very much presentation and lecture. So it's either a lecture or it's a presentation and a seminar with the presentation going on and me giving it. And I'm going to record the long patrol tomorrow for this one because I'm going to refine the script overnight. Hmm. That's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, although we do sometimes go overboard so worshipping a certain aircraft. Greg Stowski, you worry me with your love of the black man, black man. Thomas Vanderbilt, well, yes, we're on there. I'm starting to change my opinion on professors and doctors. We are an eccentric breed. As a whole. And Danny Freeman, I do like that point because I do make that point regularly. We also encourage questions by anyone. Very much the there are no stupid questions. Thomas Charm. Yeah, that's how I run my lectures. I don't always have done. If anyone says there are stupid questions, they get told to grow up. There's no such thing. Because usually, if you have a question, someone else has that question as well. Yes, the problem of land and sea, that's why the Anglosphere w was and is worried by German, Russian, and extended, extended to China lands. It negates a great deal of their sea control. It is problematic. Well, Hmm. Thompson, just as restocking, so I've got to say, now we're on to books. Did you happen to see my very sad, shocking Discord post this morning? Uh, not yet. I have logged into no, uh, Discord today. I've been covering so many lectures. I've had about three or four today I've had to cover. It's been quite weird because I had an empty day booked uh, with just one seminar and one one to one with a student, and then I had more turn up. And I had to deal with. Come, Penasol do get some good book, great books, very quality. They're lovely. They're lovely quality. I do have. There are none of these books. Am I going to be nasty about because I like them all? But I do have some codicils for them all, for most of them.
Dan Freeman, I'm working my way through warships after London, Jordan. So far, good. I really like warships after Washington, Jordan 2011. Yeah. Greg Southey. Yeah, that. So. Night Hammerix, don't bring up the FBI, KGB, GRU, MI5, and whatever China has. We'll all want to get involved then. <laughs> um, seem right. Not vulnerable bits like canal locks on the sewers. Just sand the gates bombs, so sunk ships, not long-term blocks. Mm. Mondo, I got naval policy between wars 1919 to 1929, 1930 to 39 for a glaring total of £20. Cool! Very good. Hmm. Melanie, 1640. Duckler, I mean, you are sort of forcing me to watch it because I enjoy the stuff and you've made yourself a source of great information. Thank you. That's what I like to hear. I'm wondering, just wondering, does everyone forget the U boat campaign of 1943? Or is it just me? Or do I need to read books? No, they don't forget. It does happen. But it's the trouble is. A lot of people forget about the ships. I've done a fair number of videos now looking at the smaller ships because. The World War Two. Sometimes when you're talking about wars, they become a case of this cruiser was here, this battleship, this aircraft carrier, da 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 da. And as everyone knows, one of my favorite hobby horses is start talking about the destroyers, the sloops, the frigates, the corvettes, and all the things the smaller ships are getting up and the motor torpedo boats are getting up. And that's one of the things I really love about the channel is that quite a lot of this, uh, quite a lot of viewers have also been encouraging me to go and talk about that and finding it interesting alongside me. So that's been really quite cool. Also, you mention a fluffy research assistant immediately before a large orange cat jumps up between me and the computer, then crawls up onto my shoulders. Well, that's good. I have a large, fluffy poodle who, when he is in here, when I'm recording videos normally, he doesn't usually come in when I'm live, but he does sometimes come in when I'm recording videos. And he always helps me out when I'm doing my reading downstairs or anything like that. He usually is sitting in my lap. And when I say large, I mean full size. He's a full size poodle. Um, if he stands up on his hind legs, he's up here, quite happily. Um, likes to get, uh, likes to have be carried around uh, as if he's a toy one, and he's massive. So there's me carrying him around, and he's sort of his head's up here, and I'm supporting him. He's a lovely dog, though. He's a wonderful dog. Just doing my bit to preserve quirky British aviation history. I'm glad. I'm frustrated that every documentary ends in 1943 too. It's like, you boat in 1944? Where? Um, some of the biggest wolf packs assembled were in 1944, I recall, and the heaviest fighting, only reverse. Yes, but the trouble is, by 1944, he doesn't sell the story of 1944 onwards, well, 1943 onwards, arguably, you have very good escorts. You have lots of anti-submarine warfare, uh, anti-submarine mortars entering service. You have lots of escort numbers, and you start to see the submarines getting killed with irregularity. And this is a problem if you want history to go a certain way, because quite a lot of history, and this is my point when I'm looking and when I'm talking about history books, sometimes I go, look at why in what context the author is writing them. What is the author trying to make the case for? One of the reasons why British naval aviation in the interwar years and in World War II doesn't get the coverage in comparison to the American and Japanese is because it's dealing with a very different scenario than the American and Japanese and just doesn't fit the scenario as is being looked for during the Cold War. In that in Cold War, they're looking for the big battle. They're looking for the battle up in the Barents Sea, up sort of in the high north. They're looking for that big battle, so they're looking for the information about those big battles. And multi-carrier, big carrier battles, the British had the doctrine in into war years, but they don't actually really get to do multi-carrier operations till you're talking about them getting into the Indian Ocean and into the Far East. Why? 
because even though they start off World War II with the largest carrier arm and the largest fleet air arm, they lose some carriers early on. They have them also. They have to cover the whole world. They're not just fighting in the Pacific or fighting in the Atlantic or able to concentrate their forces in the Pacific. They have to have their forces in the Atlantic, the Mediterranean, the South Atlantic, the Indian Ocean, all over the place. And that means you can't concentrate the numbers. Plus, they turn over a lot of shipyard production from major ships to little ships to build up the forces to fight the anti-submarine war of the Battle Atlantic in the 1940s to 43. Karma, can you please do book reviews with Drax sometimes, maybe for Penasol or something? That would be quite interesting, us to reviewing books together. Dan Krim, any chance universities pay for these for their Probably not now they're online. But that really doesn't worry me. I do like to go in into universities and give lectures when I'm paid to. It's always nice. Ron Cash, hmm, going to have to ha have to break ranks. My wife can see too um, too uh, can see too. I'm far too happy talking to people about boring stuff that interests me. <laughs> yeah, take care, Ron. Thank you. How's your ankle? Uh, it's better. I'll take the doggy for a walk in a bit. Actually, that's. It is nine o'clock, and that is about the time I did promise the fluffy research assistant I would take for a wander today because I had so much teaching today. So I'm going to say any last questions, and I will. I hope you've all enjoyed, enjoyed this, and I will see you on for any. So any last questions, and I'll see you on Thursday. For if I'm not mistaken, Legacy of the Battle of Trafalgar, which I previewed Legacy of Trafalgar with all the stuff currently going on about Nelson. I'm probably going to have to rewrite some of that presentation. Battle of Trafalgar and its legacy is the 22nd of October. New bilge pumps up. Yeah, I uploaded it. It's new bilge pumps is us looking at networking this week. Uh, next week's will be with a guy called Steve George. And the week after, uh, who's a very good aero engineer who's worked in the Falklands War and on the F-35. So that should be really cool. And then there's an announcement in tonight's bilge pumps about who we're going to have in two weeks' time. Which is going to be fun. So basically, um, we record on a Friday. And it gets published on late Tuesday, early Wednesday. So that's the thing. It's, it gets published technically midnight, Tuesday, Wednesday. So there's a bit on UK time. And then it'll be coming out. Hope you enjoyed them. Kings Rook, thank you for the stream, live stream. Dr. Raz, pleasure. John Shea, thank you. And thank you for being here. Angus Asano, thank you. Daniel Freeman. Roland Cash, thank you for being here. Carl Harmon, thank you for being here. Melanie, 16040, thank you for being here. What all is currently going on about Nelson? Well, someone after his death published a letter that they claim is from him, which a section appears to support slave, the slave trade, but it's all very sort of... And it's a case of, uh, should he be... It, there's now a debate over whether he should have the status he does have, etc., in Britain, all these things, and there's a bit of ambiguity about his legacy. So we're going to get, we'll probably get into that a bit because in many respects, Nelson is valued for what he represents, not necessarily for what he's done. And there are other ones to consider. 
Carl Gasman, a bit off, but did you manage to finish Drakenfell's Anacona video? Yes, I did. It's cool. Thank you, Felix. Uh, Trent, uh, Thomas Van Oen, true, depends on your focus entirely. I'm interested in electronic history and know some people repairing German radar sets. Lawrence machines. Ooh, German radar sets. Heesh. Those are complicated beasts. Ron Cash, Blinder, Dr. Lark, I need trigger warnings if we are getting involved in 50s post colonial stuff again, I think, though. Ah, just wait until we get into some of the stuff coming up. Silly Manakota, thank you. Dunra Kahanama, thank you. Take care. DGV40, thanks. Kahaman. When you do brew ships, I'll be entering a Welsh lockdown for two weeks, maybe longer. Please make it interesting. I know you will. We will do. We will do. It's going to be, I think, I honestly have a feeling next week's bilge pumps will be a two-parter, and this week's brew ships will be quite a long one. So I'm sorry. We have Sunday at 7. I'll be there normally. And Dan Freeman, what's so better? Are they going to start there too? It's oh, there's all sorts actually going on. Ben Laura, I have timed as well. Well, you have you have got your suggestion is in has made it through to the patrons for next week, next month. <sighs> take care, Dan Crew and uh, Stafford Thompson. Take care. Thank you for another live lecture. It was always a pleasure. It's a pleasure to have you here. Yeah, I have to say, and I will say this again, I've said this before in Nelson Leffer, A, we're not quite sure whether he wrote it or not. B, we don't, haven't seen the letter written to him. This is letter is published. Uh, C, this letter is published years after he's dead. Um, he's responding to it. Years after he's died and at a time by someone who's very pro a movement and Clay was his friend from when he was out and claiming. And also C uh, D, um there's his own issue with slavery in that he takes on the Haitian general and his uh, servant as members of his crew to keep the give them protection from the French when they're trying to get away from the French. Um he himself takes in lots of slaves. If they make it to a Royal Navy ship, they get made members of the crew. So they can't be taken back because and then, then the Royal Navy just goes, they're our crew. There's the fact the fleet he commands at Trafalgar is quite as multicultural as is. And there's also the fact that in the nicest way in the period he lives, these things, whilst they perhaps are becoming more and more unpalatable, are... It's an issue which is something to get into, which is something to think about in terms of the legacy of Trafalgar. But really, the legacy of Trafalgar is not as much about Nelson as the as the cultural history of Trafalgar makes it out of. I would say actually the legacy of Trafalgar and what happens afterwards is more down to Collingwood, who is his own complexities. But if you're ever in Newcastle, go see his grave. It's in the it's in the cathedral. Night Night Greg Sadowski. Uh Night Night King's Rook. So night night everyone. Thank you for being here. I hope you've had a nice time. And as I said, I'm off to now walk the puppy dog, so thank you very much. Take care and see you on Thursday. Hope you enjoyed it.